welcome you this afternoon to a public talk by His Holiness Kimpo Jigme Punsok. His Holiness was born in 1933 in northeastern Tibet. About 10 years ago, he began actively teaching in Tibet after several decades of uh, decline in the Buddhist teachings there. He is responsible for greatly increasing the spread of Buddhism in that part of Tibet and has brought many tens of thousands of Tibetans and even a few Chinese into the Buddha Dharma during that time. <coughs> we are extremely fortunate to have him. It was through what was virtually a series of miraculous logistical sequences that had happened, none of which, many of which should never have occurred. Telephone connections that are still un not understood. Um, he managed to get his visa and his permission to leave China and we are extremely fortunate to have him with us here in Nova Scotia. His addition of his trip to Nova Scotia was very much last minute so we were a little bit uh, uh, scurrying about but we are very very pleased to have him and honored and I would like to request His Holiness to teach us this afternoon. Thank you. Since <laughs> Dirham <laughs> Jo <laughs> Now the subject today well, I'd like to speak a little bit today about um, the tradition of Buddhism and the, the types of practices that are employed um, in daily life which are in accordance with the Buddhist tradition. Is the mic? Oh yeah, 
We should all recognize that we all are experiencing a state of great fortune. The reason for this is, first of all, that we are born um, in this world of ours called Zambuling. And the reason that this, this world of ours, which is actually the southern continent called Zambuling, The reason that this world of ours called Zambuling, which is the southern continent, um, is so fully endowed is because if we examine the way that um, life is carried out in the other continents, to the east, to the west, and to the north, although there is human life on those continents, and there are endowments, and there are pleasurable experiences, um, it is impossible for any of those human beings to meet with the Buddha Dharma or practice the, the Buddha Dharma. It simply does not exist there. <laughs> So then in this world of ours, the southern continent, again called Zambuling, it is also very difficult to actually obtain a precious human rebirth, to be reborn as a human being in a situation with all of the uh, endowments and states of freedom. And so if that situation has been obtained, it is considered to be extremely precious and extremely excellent. Because if one were actually reborn in the hell realm, the hungry spirit realm, the animal realm, the titan realm, or the deva realm, um, the suffering that must be endured there is absolutely unbearable. Um, so much so that there is absolutely no opportunity to practice the Dharma. And even if one is reborn in a God's realm, in the realms of gods, um, although these are marvelous places, fully endowed with pleasures and everything is very wondrous, um, still, because one is so consumed with the pleasure of the experience, uh, then one never has any opportunity to practice Dharma because one is not inclined to do so. And so the spiritual path uh, remains unpracticed. In that, Lord Buddha Shakyamuni presented the three categories of teachings in this world, the teachings on the Pratimoksha, the Bodhisattva, and the mantra in those three categories or vehicles. Um, anyone who has a precious human rebirth, who is able to connect with these teachings, um, has the opportunity to accomplish them in their entirety, if they so desire. But if someone is reborn as a god, in the God's realms, for instance, they would not have the opportunity to practice any of these teachings. It's not something that would occur for them. And so therefore, more than rebirth as a God, a human rebirth is absolutely sublime and it's something very difficult to obtain. 
Dinar ton babcım dendi. Ta jimjan alçı bat tam çetkene. Hayvi lakbi lizeri kelamana. Ta çette hıngabjut nzatsa de amelirim bo çeri. Tartar hani nalan dıt tovyo patela ar gabtu kebeljan kit gubarit. And so it is always considered by those who follow the Buddha, the followers of the Buddha's teachings, that the human rebirth is something that is more sublime than even birth as a god. And in context of that, the precious human rebirth, with its freedoms and endowments, is the most difficult rebirth to obtain. And once it is obtained, then we should always feel a sense of true joy and gratitude. Denny? In addition to that, it is very, um, very rare to be born at a time when the Buddha has come into this world. A period of time, which is a time that the Buddha has come into the world, is called um, a fortunate aeon. And um, that fortunate aeon is termed, is termed such because it refers to a time that the Buddha was present in the world, that his presence is known. Whereas a time when his presence is unknown in the world is called a dark aeon. As for these two aeons of time, the dark aeons are very abundant. They are, they are, there are multitudes of them in terms of time. But the light aeons, the time when the Buddha comes and the lamp of, of the Buddha's presence is in this world, these are only sort of interspersed in between an abundance of dark periods of time. And so therefore, it is, it is also considered to be rare. And this is why um, it is considered by Buddhists that uh, to be born in a time when the Buddha has come into the world is also very rare and very precious, uh, let alone having the opportunity to connect with his teachings and actually put them into practice. So then, assuming we have the great fortune of the Buddha's presence in the world, if the Buddha came and didn't teach the Dharma, then again it might not be as fortunate, but in fact, of course, he did teach the Dharma. Not only that, if the Dharma had already vanished from this world, that would be a, a certain situation, which it is not. The Dharma is still present in this world. Not only did the Buddha teach the Dharma, but he turned the wheel of the Dharma teachings on three great occasions. And all of those teachings are still very much present in this world. They remain stable in this world. And so because of the presence of the, of the Buddha's doctrine um, and as something that we can connect with, uh, we should feel, we should understand how rare it is and we should feel a sense of true joy and gratitude. However, once again, in that the teachings are present, if we don't meet with a qualified spiritual mentor, a lama, 
a spiritual teacher who can explain these teachings to us, then we wouldn't understand how to really connect with them and how to practice. So we also must have the auspicious coincidence of meeting with a true spiritual guide. For if we don't, again, we don't have the same state of good fortune. <clears throat> and it is also even more rare to, let's say, meet with a Lama, receive the teachings of the Buddha from the Lama, but then to actually be inspired to practice those teachings. <laughs> Therefore, all of us should think about it. When I mention how rare and precious our opportunity is, that which is fully endowed, it refers to what I just mentioned, that we are born in this southern continent, Zambuling, the best of all places to be born, in a precious human rebirth, that we are born at a time that the Buddha has come into the world. We are born at a time that the Buddha not only came into the world, but gave the Dharma teachings. We're born at a time that the Dharma teachings have not vanished from the world. They're still with us. And we're also able to meet with kind and compassionate spiritual mentors who introduce us to the teachings, who are willing to teach us. And so therefore, our situation right now is like the blooming of a Udamwara flower, which is something that blooms just once in an aeon, which is exceedingly rare to see, and that is life to our present state of rebirth. So therefore, we should experience or we should sort of give rise to a strong sense of joy and gratitude. With this type of fully endowed situation, which, where everything is so conducive, first and foremost then, we must go ahead and try to develop uh, very deep faith. If we were to um, look at faith um, in terms of, of distinctions or um, levels of faith, usually um, it is considered that faith is developed in three ways, on three levels. First of all, um, a faith of, which is like an attraction, a faith that is based on being attracted. Uh, the second level of faith becomes a faith which wishes to emulate. And finally, the third level of faith is, is what is called the fully convinced experience of faith, which is irreversible. <laughs> And these three types of faith are um, actually applied to the three jewels of refuge in the following way. Um, the faith, which is um, faith based on strong attraction, is a way that we would feel towards uh, the Buddha the first jewel of refuge. And the faith of wishing to emulate or become like is how we should feel towards the Dharma, the second jewel of refuge. And the fully convinced faith is how we should feel towards the Sangha, the third jewel of refuge. <laughs> Looking back at the first, uh, this, this faith that is uh, based on attraction, which is considered to be pure faith, um, because it just simply spontaneously occurs. It occurs when you think about the Buddha. Um, it would be a feeling of when you think about the Buddha that you feel tremendous joy and happiness and attraction. <laughs> Then he won't shake down, can't shake down, some bad as a bad. 
Now the reason that this type of pure um, faith, which is a, a faith of being attracted to an object of refuge, would, um, would arise is because the Buddha is really unlike any other great teacher who has come into this world. His qualities are unequaled. In that many great teachers, many great gods, um, are in this world as objects of refuge, such as Indra and Brahman and so forth, their qualities cannot be compared to the noble qualities of the enlightened one, Lord Buddha. <laughs> If one were to try to express the noble qualities of Lord Buddha, and when I say they're unequaled, I mean, for instance, if you were to try to compare the qualities of a bodhisattva who is on a high level, uh, one of the higher bodhisattva bhumis or stages of development. Even if you were to uh, praise those qualities for hundreds and thousands of years, it wouldn't even come close to um, being able to express even a portion of the Buddha's qualities, which are so far surpassed. <laughs> So bearing in mind how um, the Buddha's noble qualities are actually something that we cannot measure, we cannot imagine, um, we must come to have some kind of an understanding of, of what they are. It's something that we also must become aware of. At least, it, we must have, we must have some knowledge of the noble qualities so that in our minds we are able to um, reach a state or a commitment whereby we have every intention to not just achieve a temporary state of happiness um, by taking rebirth as a god or a human, but to be able to achieve an absolute state of permanent happiness by achieving enlightenment or liberation or the state or status of Buddhahood with all of the miraculous abilities that are uh, a part of that experience. And so this is, this is something that we must aspire towards and so we must know at least something about the noble qualities so that we can have that type of aspiration or strong commitment. <laughs> now the reason for this is because um, if we know if we know about the qualities of the Buddha, then if we feel that they're not something that will be of benefit to us, then there's no reason to to feel a sense of attraction or joy um, towards wanting to achieve that state. Um, on the other hand, like for example, if we wanted to become a king or a ruler, if this was a, if this was a status that we were attracted to achieving ourself, um, yet if it was something that could bring us no benefit, then there would be no reason for achieving that state. And so we have to think about what the benefits are if we are able to achieve that same state 
or that same status. And it needs to be something that can be of benefit, of true benefit to self and others. And in order to know that, we have to know what the qualities are, but at the same time, we must be able to look ahead and see what the benefits are of those qualities. <laughs> Now of all of the many qualities of the Buddha, they can be um, condensed into the three categories of omniscience, um, altruism or loving kindness, and power or potency. In terms of omniscience, which is also uh, wisdom knowledge, um, the mind of the Buddha is a mind which understands how to place all sentient beings as limitless as space itself in the status of permanent peace and happiness and knows precisely how to employ the methods to see to the liberation of all beings from their different types of suffering. And so this is the type of benefit that is derived from achieving that same state of awareness. And this is in context of the wisdom quality or this quality of omniscience, of absolutely knowing how to set sentient beings free from suffering and place them in permanent happiness. <laughs> But in addition to that, um, the Buddha also has so many noble qualities which are all the result of the development of perfect altruism <coughs> mentioned in the three. And so this quality of loving kindness or compassion is absolutely essential as well. You can't just have omniscience or wisdom without compassion, otherwise still there will be no true benefit and the methods employed cannot be of true benefit. For instance, even an ordinary person, even though they may be very learned, if they have a rough character, um, then they really can't be of very much benefit to others because they're always putting others off and so people would not be interested to listen to them even though they may know a lot. If their character is rough and offensive, they're of no benefit. And so loving kindness and compassion must also be present. <laughs> So if we were to think about the kind of loving kindness and compassion that the Buddha possesses or the, the, the mind of the Buddha experiences, then we use the example of the love that a mother has for her only child and multiply that by hundreds and thousands of times. And this is the type of love that the Buddha has for all living beings. <laughs> How is it that the Buddha was able to develop this level of loving kindness and compassion? It occurred at the time that he himself was training on the path, the path to become enlightened. Um, as a practitioner, during that time, he always trained um, in the practice of being of benefit to others and cherishing others more than himself. And at the time of his enlightenment, because this was always his practice and aspiration, he was enlightened in the state of awareness of totally loving and cherishing others more than oneself. <laughs> That's 
Yer to give you an example of how it is that the Buddha you know, dedicated his life to um, others and would give up his body time and time again in, in his uh, pursuit to develop this level of compassion, even after he was enlightened, um, when he then went to Varanasi, to the famous deer park, where he gave his first Dharma discourse which is known as the first turning of the Dharma wheel. At that time, um, in order to express his um, compassion for the benefit of others as well, there were boom truck mumbo drikson. He actually uh, took off his own head, removed his head in front of many hundreds of thousands. Dear <laughs> And there are many, many occasions, um, not only just in Varanasi, but um, in many other places in the world where the Buddha gave his body, gave parts of his body, gave the blood from his body for the benefit of other beings, just simply exchanging himself uh, for the sake of benefiting others. <laughs> However, it was never a case where the Buddha would express loving kindness towards those uh, who he was close to, such as his relatives or those disciples of, him, of his who were already attracted to him, and not show loving kindness to others. On no occasion was this type of uh, biased uh, conduct ever, ever displayed by the Buddha. <laughs> example, there was one time, one occasion, where there were two gods who were confronting the Buddha, and one was offering, making offerings to the Buddha and expressing offerings and devotion, and the other god was a demonic king who was trying to harm the Buddha. And on that occasion, he, he dealt with both of them equally and displayed loving kindness and compassion towards both of them uh, impartially. <laughs> Da ring tova da, long shit chevi kanzo nam lef seva yoni. 
Tak membet tam jelah saya melihat ni sekarang tiap sebab dia orang ikut semua orang ni tak. Tiap zaman main berapa pun dia ni ikut sebab dia ni. Tam tua ni yang ramen berapa ni am tak bersih macam ni lah. Tam tak berapa tiap sebab dia ni change gendari. And also, it was never a case where the Buddha's loving kindness and compassion was greater for those who were in higher positions or had more endowments, and was less for those who were weak or poor or meager. Never was there an occasion where the Buddha showed this type of partial, um, kind of partial experience of loving kindness. In fact, it was just the opposite, that more often than not, he was always more kind and uh, showed more compassion and love and concern for those who were in need. Then he joined in the Siva Dayana. That Dandiji, Chapter in Kentavi, then he's on the Siva Dayana. Get you want to sign in the mind. Chapter in Kentavi. Chapter in so Lord Buddha's loving kindness and compassion was never limited like those who are partial towards uh, their own people and or their own race, such as those politicians. because those leaders, those political leaders, usually express their gratitude and their kindness and their appreciation in front of thousands of people when there's some benefit to them. But if they really see a few people who are suffering, they usually don't pay any attention to that. Because the loving kindness and compassion of the Buddha, even if just one sentient being was in need, many times over he could give up his life and his blood again and again for just one single being without ever having any regret. Um, at the same time, for thousands of years, if the need be, unceasingly, the Buddha would continue to express loving kindness and compassion for those beings who are in need. And his, his expression of loving kindness and compassion is absolutely unrivaled. <laughs> Tí Yeah. 
For example, um, one time when a Buddha was in the hell realm, and his name was Karma Rupa, and he was plowing in the field with the other um, beings who were in that experience of the hell phenomena, and undergoing the sort of tremendous torture of, of laboring there indefinitely. And those messengers of the hell realm were beating them and forcing them to labor unceasingly. And at that time, he had, he had such a thought that well, if only all of the suffer could ri all of the suffering of the other beings in the hell realm could ripen upon him at this very moment, and then the uh, messenger of hell just smashed him over the head with a hammer, and he fainted. And then after he revived from that, he was reborn on the thirty-third God's realm. That deal of some of the moon, that's it of Nama, Nama, Nams, and Tis, Tuck the Jum, then the deal of Nopan Baji Somnery. Scuts it, Delayan, and Open Baji Somnery. Thieving the Chetana, that Congo, Kutukla, and the Manzimber, Pembe de Pizza, the Sea, and Germany Bartava, the Tonzapari. He was always trying to find Buddha, and he found out. I said the previous, previous one was so many, so many birds, and he always tried to harm Buddha. Did he? And so even, even those kind of things, he was still, he always calls him. Also, there is, there is one god who is a de demonic god. Lachin, who was always trying to harm the Buddha. And even from previous lives, it was the historical that there were so many occasions that he was trying to harm the Buddha and bring him some kind of harm and get him to react. But on every occasion, he never showed any adversity or t any type of a reaction and just continued to show him more and more loving kindness and compassion. <laughs> Then the Nibi Yundan Zidu Gon and Nibi made Nana, Tam Kinsi, Yanaka Kan of Kinamar. So, in this way, the Buddha possessing um, this unrivaled omniscience and loving kindness and compassion, it is still not complete without power or potency. Nibi made Nana, Tak Rin Nana, Margan Mukyam, Lakayam, maybe, Takan Muzikaranga with the Chikir Zona. Like the example of the old woman with no hands, who sees her child being carried off by rushing water, and has such an experience of inconceivable compassion for the child, and can do nothing about it but watch. And so like that, even though one may possess knowledge and this altruism on the level of the Buddha, without power or potency, again, the method is not complete to help sentient beings. The power, the potency that the Buddha possesses is, um, corresponds to his body, to his speech, and to his mind. The type of noble qualities and power that the Buddha possesses physically is that just by simply being in his presence, um, it has the potency to liberate sentient beings from the suffering of cyclic existence, just to meet him, just to be in his presence. So to actually meet with the Buddha, um, to have it, to directly be in his presence, then this is the case. But even now, just to think about his noble qualities, this is also the case.
And also, the Buddha has, has manif manifested in so many various ways, not just only in a human embodiment, but also in the form of statues and so forth. And it is also clearly stated in the sutras that um, to have devotion to, to pay homage to, to make offerings to, to make prayers to those uh, stupas which contain the relics of the Buddha and those those statues that are molded in his likeness, whether they are made of gold or copper or even stone, uh, also brings about the same results as though one were to meet with the Buddha directly. <laughs> Um, for example, even if someone um, is able to, to uh, see a tanka, which uh, is a painting which um, depicts the form of the Buddha, which is extremely pleasing and attractive, just even to meet with that form of the Buddha is something that alone has the power to bring the benefit of um, imbuing the mind with peace and happiness. So, if one actually is able to see a form of the Buddha and have strong faith and devotion towards that form, not just only acknowledging its beauty and feeling attracted to it, but having faith and devotion, then um, needless to say how much merit is accumulated from that. Even if one sees a form of the Buddha and becomes angry, it is still taught in, in the sutras, it clearly states that just by the merit of coming in contact with the form of the Buddha, um, after a very long time, eventually one will receive the benefits. <laughs> Therefore, in terms of the noble qualities and power of the Buddha's body alone, then it is taught in many of the sutras that just by meeting with, of course, clearly, if you were to actually be in the presence of the Buddha directly, it goes without saying, but just by meeting, by meeting any image of the Buddha, uh, or even having single-pointed faith and devotion, or even having a vision, or having an experience in the dream state, is something that will actually bring out the enlightened noble qualities within oneself. <laughs> Malah kau tu mungkin macam sendiri.
이런 거 하고 그렇게 하고 그냥 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 I didn't know that I had a mic until just now, and then I heard it, <laughs> and I realized it's down there. Then he came as a pajangana, tap jum then the song, that I took them could be two day on. Then Musa told that then if some give me cabaret. Now, as we're actually meeting with uh, the teachings of the Buddha, of course, if we are fortunate to be able to actually read the syllables of the letters of the Buddha's teachings, the Dharma, um, then this is the best. It's inconceivable. Um, it, it alone has the power to um, close the door to rebirth in the lower realms, and also just having contact with the syllables of the teaching of, of uh, the Dharma can extend our life, give us the, the uh, blessing of longevity and good health. And um, this, this goes without saying. <laughs> So, even when we think about if we don't have uh, the opportunity to meet directly with the teachings, um, just by having some kind of a contact with the syllables, we have these benefits. Let's look at the benefits that those birds and deer have at the time of a Dharma teaching. Now, of course, they can't really meet directly with the teachings or read the syllables, but if they hear the sound of a conch being blown or a drum that is being beaded at the beginning of a teaching or at any time during the teaching, then by hearing that sound, also it is taught clearly that in a very short time they will be freed from uh, that lower stage of rebirth and will gradually be led to liberation. And as for the noble qualities of the mind, the power of the Buddha's mind, um, then individual sentient beings um, actually receive to, on their capacity, according to their sensibility, um, the Buddha's teachings and his loving kindness and his wisdom knowledge in terms of its expression as miraculous activity. And so we can, we can understand that the qualities of the Buddha's mind uh, are expressed by his expression of miraculous activity, which is able to reach all of the living beings according to their levels of sensibility. For example, it is impossible for there not to be a wave um, that arises or wells forth from the great ocean. And so just like that, it is impossible that the miraculous activity of the Buddha will not be able to reach and accomplish the purpose of all sentient beings. <laughs> So from the, the field of enlightened awareness, the Buddhas send forth um, boundless intentional manifestations in order to tame the minds of beings according to their needs and sensibilities. And so if a Buddha needs to manifest as a Buddha, 
then he will, she will, as a bodhisattva, as a shravaka, a hearer, as a pradika, or a solitary realizer, on whatever level is, is deemed necessary in order to tame the minds of beings according to their needs. <laughs> <coughs> and even the Buddha's manifest um, in other realms as uh, spirits and entities, as birds, as wild animals, and as um, animals that live under water. <laughs> In forests, in jungles, in the wild, for the purpose of bringing the Dharma to those places, for the purpose of benefiting the sentient beings, the living beings who dwell there, the Buddhas manifest there as well, and the Dharma is spread on those, in those places, according to the needs and sensibilities of the beings who dwell there. Therefore, it should be clearly understood that for the benefit of each and every sentient being, in order to establish them in peace and happiness throughout the day and night, unceasingly, three times in the day, three times in the night, which means unceasingly, the Buddha always understands the needs of sentient beings and tries to benefit them and accomplish their purpose in whatever way is deemed necessary. Now, this is the reason why we should feel attracted to the Buddha, and when we think of the Buddha, we should have great joy and gratitude. And so, to imbue that within you again, I would like to say a few words. That the unsurpassed teacher, Lord Buddha Shakyamuni, absolutely knows the methods which bring benefit to all sentient beings. It is impossible that the Buddha would not know this. <coughs> So, realizing then that the Buddha is totally omniscient in knowing the methods to benefit beings, if he didn't have loving kindness and compassion for them, he wouldn't show them those methods. And so he must have loving kindness and compassion as well. <laughs> And even though he possesses omniscience and loving kindness and compassion, if he didn't have power or potency, he wouldn't be able to apply those methods in such a way that they would actually accomplish the purpose of others. And so he also has power, the full potency, to be able to actualize his full potential in terms of methods. <laughs> It is only the Buddha in all of this world who possesses this type of unsurpassed and unrivaled <laughs> omniscience, compassion, and power. There is no one else in this world who can equal him. Dina, 
And so, except for people who have no heart in their body or no brain in their head, everyone else would have to have this type of attraction to Lord Buddha Shakyamuni as the unsurpassed teacher. Now then, the second level of faith is the development of, uh, of the uh, faith that that attracts one to the Dharma, which is that to want to emulate. Here, one must come to know about the Dharma as the teachings of the path, which do lead to the state of enlightenment, the state of liberation. And one must um, be able to develop a very specialized level of faith towards the Dharma teachings. If we want to practice uh, the Buddha Dharma purely, then we must understand that all that is wholesome and virtuous should be accomplished, and all that is unwholesome and non-virtuous must be abandoned. When we think about that which falls into the category of being wholesome or virtuous, in brief, it would be the consideration of never wanting to harm any other living being for any reason and developing love and compassion for each and every one of them. And towards any being, whether they are high, middle, or low in terms of one's perspective, to have negative thoughts towards them or to actually show some physical adversity or aversion towards them <coughs> is considered to be unwholesome or non-virtuous. <coughs> so, therefore, in order to be able to abstain from harming sentient beings, uh, the Buddha taught the ten virtues. Excuse me, the, the Buddha taught four. The Buddha taught four um, ways through which wholesome accumulations occur. And these four should be practiced by all of those true followers of the Buddha. The first of the four is to never retaliate if someone abuses you. So the first one uh, is to never retaliate. Is uh, this is more of a verbal exchange? And so, secondly, physically, if someone physically tries to abuse you, uh, you would not physically retaliate. <laughs> And then the third one is to just remain patient uh, without having any kind of a response. Even if they throw a stick, a club, or a stone at you, no matter how badly they physically abuse you, to have no response at all, no negative retaliation. <laughs> And 
Do you care so much? Look, you're right. Some comments are the same, some comments are physical. I mean, verbal abuse. Insulting. I am insulting. Rated deterioration, do you ever call my son? No, I'm not saying that we know. And the fourth is if you are being verbally abused to the point where you're being insulted. Like someone is saying to you, you're a thief, you're a robber, you're a liar. Uh, whatever kind of negative language that they are saying, um, you, would not, you would not have any kind of verbal remark. <laughs> So here's a Buddha taught that if you actually, even though in this kind of a situation it appears as though you are the loser, you are actually the winner. To abstain from retaliating in this way makes one, one makes one the victor. So therefore, really, you know, someone who is able to practice these four purely is really considered to be a true follower of the Buddha. And if they're not practiced, if one is you know, easy to react and shows this type of retaliation, then although one may uh, consider oneself to be a follower of the Buddha, um, from the point of view of, of true quality or, or true meaning, one is not, because these four are extremely important. <laughs> So how do you how do you actually meditate in this way? How can you put these four into practice? Um, of course, if someone is trying to harm you and inflict harm upon you in any of these ways, naturally anger will arise. But one has to try to, you know, think into that and realize uh, what the true situation is at hand and to develop a sense of love and compassion for the individual who is doing this based on their own ignorance. And one has to be able to have a broad enough scope to see ahead to see what the results will be if one in turn reduces oneself to their level. And so to use a good example, it would be like the way that a mother usually thinks about her offspring, her son or her daughter. No matter how much her son or her daughter are abusing her, then still she would love them and have compassion for them, even though it may be a difficult situation. And so in this way, we should try to practice to have that kind of love and compassion for others who are harming us. <laughs> And then it can be taken even further as one develops in this practice um, of having a sense of love and compassion for um, the object 
then if one goes, goes deeper in the practice, one would actually be able to feel, let them harm me, no matter what they do to me. How much they abuse me, it simply doesn't matter. They could even cut off my head. Because I, I actually hope that all of their suffering that they are experiencing could ripen upon me, so that they don't have to experience the suffering. This is how one should think. <coughs> So this is how we should pra be able to practice with different individuals, um, abstaining from allowing anger to arise and be expressed. But all the more so, we should try to extend this in a broader sense to the way that we feel about situations in the world and towards other countries and other races of people and so forth. <coughs> So even though it is extremely difficult to be disrespected by others, no matter how much disrespect is shown to one, the Buddha has always taught that not only should we never retaliate with anger, we should show respect back to that individual. We should show honor and respect no matter what. This is why the Dharma, which is the teaching of the Buddha, is a teaching that promotes the practice of never harming others and always doing what one can to be of benefit to others as the main focus of the entire path. And so this is the point that's being brought out here. One has to take it literally. <laughs> So maybe you're thinking, oh yes, this doctrine sounds very good. In fact, the principles are excellent, but no one can really practice this. This is something that is really far too difficult for an ordinary person to be able to do. Um, because it is a difficult practice, which is very true, even for myself, uh, I am a Tibetan, I'm a monk, in fact I'm a Lama, and even I find it something very difficult to actually practice purely. So this is why each and every one of us have to um, practice the Dharma of Lord Buddha in gradual stages of development. Like for example, for those good lamas in Tibet, even at the cost of their life, they would never take the life of another living being, nor would they ever consider to steal or embezzle the possessions of someone else. So 
Now then, let's take all of you. Maybe from this day onward, if you were to take a vow that from this day onward, I will no longer take the life of any living being. I will no longer take the possessions or steal from anyone else, take that which is not given to me. Um, I will no longer intentionally harm any other living being. This might be difficult for you to do, to actually take that vow and keep it. But perhaps you have the aspiration to want to be able to do that, which means that you can begin to train and develop so that this is something that will become possible. In a chum than the Tamba de la Jan and Sever gave you my nose in the Jan Simpsons and the Taps and Bang and the Jura submos good now. Tip chum than the Jinz Tama seven months of chum than the Gana. That's the child of someone. If you open the door to someone's hand on the day, then it is a full of fiction. However, it should be understood that according to the Buddha's doctrine then, because uh, the principal focus is to never harm any other beings, if someone sort of um, is um, said to be practicing or claims to be practicing Buddhism or the teachings of the Buddha but is harming others, then this is really to contradict the doctrine and they're not really following the Buddha's teachings. <laughs> And this is why too it is said, and, and I quote, I quote that um, one should always try, as followers of the Buddha, one should always try to tame one's own mind and to never disturb the mind of any other being. And so this is something that we all have the potential to do. And so gradually we, we must try to accomplish this, the taming of our own mind and to never disturb the minds of others. <laughs> Tak cuma dengan kecudang mungkin bi, jerdang yang bertiangan drag, dochik yang bertiangan drag, kerja lam cakap, tenis jalan yang alak sama yang ngerger, tertayu sama yang berdekian di, tak lam sangat dekian orang di sini kerja, sini tan tertayu tuh yang berdekian jauh menyen, sama dah dekian orang transik zon di sini tertayu tuh yang berdekian orang, tak lam aku macam macam di sini di lab tak sorup sama, aku macam macam lab sorup macam ni sendiri guber. So how can this be done? <coughs> For instance, when we are experiencing extreme upheaval of conflicting emotions, like a strong upheaval of anger or desire or jealousy or pride, that mind which thinks I am better than others, and these types of concepts that become overwhelming, over, overpowered in our mind, we should immediately recognize them with our awareness and recognize that this, in fact, is an upheaval of the conflicting emotions, which is something detrimental, <laughs> unwholesome, and will bring about these, these unwanted results. And so with mindfulness, we should try to allow it to be pacified. And if it's difficult for us to do that, we should pray to the three jewels of refuge to bless us so that we will have the potential to be able to put these conflicting emotions to rest. <laughs> Tak jana na rangel liki cuban ngambadang, nak ketam nasi ngambadang. Sem di tantok ngambadang janji sem di tuan generi. Now in terms of disturbing the minds of others, this occurs when we um, enact unsuitable physical behavior, when we speak um, negative words or say things to others which may harm them um, or have negative thoughts. Ina na tak rangel janji sem di ketka. So, of course, it's best to be able to eliminate any type of conduct which disturbs the minds of others from the root. But if that's not possible and if it happens that one has actually um, engaged in some activity um, physically, verbally, or mentally which has um, 
bring, which has brought some distress or misery to someone else, then one should immediately try to feel a sense of true remorse and regret and remind oneself uh, that, for instance, I am a follower of the Buddha. This type of conduct is totally unsuitable. Now I truly regret this and in the future I will try to abstain from doing this again and to pray to the three jewels of refuge to bestow blessings. Now if you were to ask, well, what are the benefits of actually um, being careful in terms of these points, these practices, to abstain from these unwholesome accumulations of harming others? The benefits are that in this very life, one will experience longevity, good health, increase of merit, endowments, happiness, and so forth. And not just only in this life, but in the future lifetime, one will be reborn in the realm of great bliss, Amitabha's pure realm, um, the Buddha fields. And these are places where uh, the suffering of cyclic existence is non-existent. And gradually, one is able to achieve the status of perfect enlightenment and never experience any kind of suffering again. So you see, if just one person actually practices the Dharma of the Buddha, Lord Buddha's teachings, the Holy Dharma, then that one person will be free from suffering and will experience peace and happiness. If one family practices the Buddha Dharma, that entire family will be free from suffering and experience peace and happiness. If one town practices the Buddha Dharma, the entire town will be free from suffering and experience peace and happiness. Ultimate, permanent peace and happiness. If the entire country is practicing the Buddha, the Buddha Dharma, the entire country will be fully endowed in this way. If the entire world practices the Buddha Dharma, if all the beings in the world were to practice the Buddha Dharma, everyone would be free from suffering and would experience permanent peace and happiness, which would be to establish peace in this world, a situation in this world where there was no longer any suffering and only happiness. <laughs> Because anyone, everyone, only wants to have peace and happiness. <coughs> Nobody wants to suffer. If suffering does not occur, everyone is happy. There's not a single living being who wants to suffer. Therefore, in terms of that, the point is that it is only the Buddha who has been able to teach the methods which can bring peace and happiness to all beings and free all beings from suffering. If you think carefully about this, about the attributes and the qualities, the unrivaled qualities of the Dharma, the Buddha Dharma, the teachings of the Buddha, then except for someone who doesn't have a heart in their body or a brain in their head, everyone else would be attracted to the Buddha with this type of um, strong faith. 
Um, so in Tibet, we actually have, a, we have this saying, which is why I'm repeating this, because um, it really applies to someone, someone who, in fact, had examined, had examined or investigated uh, the qualities of the Buddha Dharma again and again and still doesn't have faith, still unable to develop faith, then they're like someone who is heartless or brainless. Yeah, <laughs> So this is really not to be taken literally. Like those followers of the Buddha have nice hearts in their bodies or brains in their head. But it means that those who are able to really follow the teachings accordingly so that they themselves are establishing true peace and happiness, then they are likened to, um, to individuals who are complete, that th their lives are complete in this way. <laughs> But if you want to be someone with a heart and a brain, then you should practice the Buddha Dharma without any mistake. If you know how to sleep, if you know how to walk around, if you know how to eat and put clothes on, you still you still don't qualify as someone with a brain or a heart. <laughs> So if one has a strong aspiration towards the Buddha Dharma, then this is equivalent to the second level, the development of the second level of faith, which is a faith that wishes to emulate. Now, the third level of faith is called fully convinced or irreversible, and uh, this is likened to the way that one feels towards the third jewel of refuge, the Sangha. Now, the Sangha means the spiritual community who are the followers of the Buddha. <laughs> And what that really means, that uh, primarily those who are followers of the Buddha are people who are concerned with only employing the methods which bring benefit to self and others. Those who are followers of the Buddha in this world of ours these days fall into three categories. Those who follow according to the lesser spiritual pursuit of the Hinayana who mainly practice the abstinence or abstaining from harming others intentionally. Those who practice on the level of the greater spiritual pursuit or the Mahayana who in addition to that practice uh, the methods which bring benefit to others. And those who practice on um, the mantra pursuit or the vehicle of Vajrayana who incorporate the lower two practices into the employment of methods which are not difficult and which bring results um, swiftly and extensively. <laughs> Now, 
Now if you meet with someone who is an individual who accomplishes um, <coughs> the, the practice of bringing benefit to other beings and if you recognize this quality in somebody, that there's someone who actually is able to help others and who is engaged in that type of practice, then you would, you would uh, feel a sense of uh, confidence in that person. <laughs> For example, if you have a friend, um, and this this friend is someone who is bene who is beneficial, so so a benefit to you, who is beneficial to you, who shows you respect, who is a true who is a true friend, um, then. This is someone that you will develop confidence in. You will be attracted towards and you will have confidence and trust in. Whereas if you have a friend who, who harms you, who abuses you, who disrespects you, it'll be very difficult for you to have confidence or trust in this friend. <laughs> and this is the reason why um, the fully convinced faith is the level of faith that is a, that is experienced when we experience devotion in the third jewel of refuge the sangha dina tak komchuk sam ge yonda ndor ti ba zam shit fi anri dina ke na ba sam ma tak komchuk sam la ga sa yo of to now I have given a very brief explanation of the qualities of the three jewels of refuge. I would like to ask you, do you, do you feel a sense of faith or devotion in the three jewels? Are you attracted to them? Those of you who like the three jewels, raise your hand. <laughs> <laughs> Those who don't like the three jewels, raise your hand. <laughs> Very good. Now everyone likes the three jewels. Therefore, from now on, from this moment onward and throughout all of your lifetimes, I would like you to make the aspiration and the commitment that you will always be attracted to the unsurpassed and fully endowed teacher who possesses the most exalted qualities of any teacher in this world, Lord Buddha Shakyamuni, and that you will listen to the Dharma teachings and bring them into your life and practice them to the best of your ability, and that you will always befriend the Sangha community and choose them as your first, as your first choice in terms of companionship and friendship in this world. And in this way, you will be truly living out this feeling of devotion that you have in the three jewels of refuge as your absolute objects of refuge. With this type of devotion um, developed within your mind stream, please bring your palms together at your heart and repeat after me. <laughs> Lama la gabsu chiwo. Sangi la gabsu chiwo. Sangi la gabsu chiwo. Chu la gabsu chiwo. Chu la gabsu chiwo. Gendan la gabsu chiwo. Gendan la gabsu chiwo. Lama la gabsu chiwo. Lama la gabsu chiwo. Sangi la gabsu chiwo. Sangi la gabsu chiwo. Chu la gabsu chiwo. Chu la gabsu chiwo. Gendan la gabsu chiwo. Gendan la gabsu chiwo. 
Mama la gap sum jo. Mama la gap sum jo. Sangi la gap sum jo. Sangi la gap sum jo. Shu la gap sum jo. Shu la gap sum jo. Gendan la gap sum jo. Gendan la gap sum jo. But that can be some mala gap ru don be top niri. Now all of you have received the refuge vows. From this moment onward, you may call yourself a Buddhist. <laughs> And from this moment onward, whatever activities that you want to accomplish, whether they are spiritual or of this world, you will be able to accomplish them in a way that you have not been able to before. And not only that, those humans and those negative spirits uh, who do cause harm on other levels will, not, will no longer be able to harm you because you will be protected by the three jewels from this moment onward. Now, as long as you don't ever fall under the power of incorrect view, um, if you maintain your, your vows and your, your commitment to the three jewels of refuge as you've stated it here today, then in this and in all future lifetimes, you will no longer take rebirth in the three lower realms. <laughs> And so, if you maintain this commitment and promise in an unchanging way, then you have truly, on this occasion, you have truly accomplished the purpose of a precious human rebirth. So. <coughs> Now as I look around, I think that we have a mixed crowd. There are many of you here who are native Canadians, and there are many who are um, native Americans who have moved to Canada. At any rate, I do feel that today, for, for many of you here, this is the most important and valuable thing that you've ever done in your life. <laughs> Because whether you're from the United States or Canada, I think it's probably the same, that except for Saturday and Sunday, all of the other time in your life is more or less spent in the pursuit of um, getting enough food to eat and clothes to wear and to actually be able to just simply survive in this world, to maintain yourself and to accumulate some type of wealth or position. <laughs> So except for what you've been able to accomplish in terms of your goals of having enough food to eat, enough clothing to wear, and um, a certain, certain state of status or enjoyment in this life, probably you haven't been able to accomplish too much more than that. <laughs> Uh, 
This is why I made the statement that today you have done something more meaningful than you've done in your entire life because of the benefits that you will derive from what you just did. Now many of you here probably are already Buddhists, long-time Buddhist practitioners, that's for sure. And some of you here today probably were not Buddhist before you came, and now you are. <laughs> <laughs> and now, now you're new Buddhists uh, with an appreciation for the special qualities um, of the Buddha Dharma and Sangha and so you are able to have confidence and trust in the Buddha Dharma and Sangha and that is why you went ahead and took the vows <laughs> and so I feel that what's happened here this afternoon um, makes my journey to Canada something meaningful and I also know for sure that it's something meaningful for you and this is why I say that this is a fully endowed occasion. <laughs> So, the training that you must now try to engage in, um, as best as you can, includes at all times and in all situations, in having taken refuge in the Buddha, to make prayers to the three jewels of refuge, to help you and assist you on the path, to take them as your, as your source of refuge. In having taken refuge in the Dharma, you should try your best not to ever harm any other sentient being intentionally. And in having taken refuge in the Sangha, you should try to have respect and confidence in those followers of the Buddha. Dina, that Deranga, Tenny Lirum de Kovduk, Papuina, that young Jed on Hirabli Sambi, shoot a shot in a Tenny Yingin out of Kodak. Dina, me, Hirab, the young Jedian, that Chong Chong's a mind, but that Sanji should on them did that the Keran, Kid Nambala Pamba Jetchin was in Jong Shedana, that them shed the Hibai. And although the subject today was the subject of compassion and wisdom, um, in one way I feel that I've taken that and I've expanded it to encompass, um, to encompass a teaching that gives you uh, an ability to appreciate and understand all of the Buddha's teachings um, in, one, in one kind of an explanation which will benefit you in a way that um, could not be equaled by just giving only a talk on compassion and wisdom. And so therefore, I chose to expand this and to elaborate on a general subject of the Buddha and, and the Dharma and the Sangha, which includes compassion and wisdom. And I feel that this has surely been of more benefit to you on this occasion. <laughs> And I want you to know too that I don't consider myself to be very clever or skillful with words. Um, I have kind of a style of just being honest and direct. And um, I, I felt that by really being even more so that way today, that there was a purpose here because I did it so that I could, I could give you something that would be of benefit to you in this and all future lifetimes. So for today, I will conclude the public section of um, the public talk, which is the public discussion um, in my um, in my different, in my different um, teachings that I will give here. Um, starting tomorrow, there will be more specific uh, topics and teachings that I will be giving. And so I hope to see you then.